you anyway, so you won't. So you'll all be fine. So good evening. Uh, my name's Diane. I'm not actually called DWT webinar. Um, and I'm a people engagement officer for Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. And we've got um, some lovely talks for you tonight. We have two guest speakers. We've got Liz Woodward from the Soil Association. who will talk to us about the importance of organic gardening for our health and for nature. And then we have Jamie Quint Starkey from Down to Earth in Derby. He's going to talk to us about what to plant and where and when and the importance of community growing groups as well. And then after they've both had um, their chance to talk, we're going to give um, you the chance to put your questions to them. So if you think of any questions during the talks, um, if you've got any burning questions you want to ask, pop them in the Q&A rather than in the chat, because in the chat they um, can get lost. So if you pop them in the Q&A, we'll have all the questions there that I can just go through and ask at the end. OK, so I am just going to share this for a second. So why, why go potty? Why grow your own grub? Um, back in May, we ran a campaign called Grow Don't Mow, which you may have come across. And it's a campaign to encourage people to let their gardens grow a little bit wilder to help wildlife, but also to give themselves some health and wellbeing benefits. But we know that not everyone has a lawn that they can grow wild. And in fact, one in eight people don't have gardens. Um, but any small space can make a really big impact. My slides aren't changing. <laughs> oh, I've had a fail there. I'll just do without the slides. <laughs> um, any small space is going to make a big impact, especially when we all do that little bit together and we all do a space. So the idea behind Go Potty is that whatever space you have, whether it's a windowsill, a balcony, a patio, or you're part of a community area, that you plant something. Whether you plant flowers to help pollinators or grow your own grub, and you get to eat it as well. Um, you don't need to go out and buy expensive pots, fancy things. We're asking people to get creative and recycle things. So I've worked in the past with school groups where we've gone in and we've made their um, grounds better for wildlife or put in facilities for them to grow things. And we've made raised beds out of old tires. So you can use anything. You can use tires, like in the picture there, you've got wellies, teapots, buckets, absolutely anything you can put soil in, you can plant something in it. Um, the more unusual, the better, maybe. And it's not just the wildlife that's going to benefit from you doing this. Um, time spent outdoors gardening or nurturing plants has been proven to be good for you as well. It's been shown to lower stress, to decrease depression, and it also improves your mood. So what more of an excuse do you need? It's good for wildlife. It's good for you. It's not going to cost a lot because you're recycling things and you get to eat it at the end. That's the big winner for me, you get to eat it. So um, listen to the experts tonight, ask the questions at the end, and um, then I'm hoping everyone's gonna leave this webinar tonight and go rooting around their attics and their garages and their spaces and look for containers that they can plant up. And if you go on our website, you can sign up to go potty, um, and your action will go on the map and you can put, send us up your pictures of the things that you're planting up. Don't wait for them to get big and flowery. Just send us your pot as soon as you planted it. And you could win one of our lovely adoption packs. So it's worth giving it a go. But these are the people who know how to do it better than I do. So <laughs> I'm going to hand you over now to Liz to talk, first of all. Oh. Hello. Right, I'm trying to share my screen. I can't share my screen. No, bear with me. Right. It's not coming up, I'm afraid. Oh. Jordan, have you got the PowerPoint there? Are you able to share it? Uh, give me one second and I will open it up. 
Thank you. Okay, can you hear me and see that? Yes. Right, brilliant. So, so hello, um, I'm Liz from um, the Soil Association and um, I've been oh, growing organically for many years, but working with Garden Organic and the Soil Association for sort of well over sort of 15 years. And I phrased it sort of, why organic? Um, because why not? You know, it's a no brainer to me. Um, for years I was growing organically and I didn't even realize it. And I suspect it's the same for sort of many people because it's the natural way to grow. Um, so um, if we move on to the next slide. Yeah, all living things depend on each other. So by growing organically, um, you're supporting the natural environment um, because you're respecting and connecting with nature. You can enjoy fruit and veg that contribute to a healthy diet and naturally adopt a more sustainable lifestyle by sort of growing organically. Um, many people sort of during lockdown um, found, um, you know, they were starting to sort of grow their own and it meant they could sort of start reconnecting with nature. And, you know, we all struggled in lockdown. I've been shielding for a long time. Um, so it can really help your mental well-being by reducing stress and improving your mood. So it can reduce your sort of anxiety and any depression that you might have. Um, wherever you, you know, you live, whatever the space you have, whether it's a windowsill or a large garden, you know, we're all responsible for um, how we treat the environment and um, safeguarding it for the future. So really you're sort of growing organically because you want to create a space where sort of nature can thrive, um, plants and wildlife can share a healthy habitat, um, habitat um, you know, that's rich with, you know, life and nutrients. So I thought I'd give you a few sort of facts and figures. Um, so 95% of our food comes from the soil. So that's whether you're growing directly in the soil or whether it's providing grass for sort of animals to graze on. And 52% of the world's soil is degraded. So every minute we lose the equivalent of 30 football pitches, um, which is pretty scary. Um, and soil, it's such a huge carbon store. You know, we've got COP happening soon. Um, a lot of discussion about climate change. And UK soils can hold sort of an estimated 9.8 billion tonnes of carbon. That's the global carbon emissions made by humans in one year. So I think that's sort of pretty amazing. But also, you know, we have other things like thinking about our wildlife and um, insects. So 71% of British butterflies are facing extinction. So we can do something about that. And 35 UK bee species face extinction as well. And that's all due to pesticides, habitat loss, climate change, and sort of pest and disease and invasive species. So, you know, I sort of, you know, say, grow organically it's it's much more natural but also is it healthier um well you've got lower levels of pesticides antibiotics and hormones you know inorganic food um views can vary it can be quite contentious um but a number of studies do suggest um organic foods um, supplies more micronutrients like sort of vitamin C, iron, magnesium, phosphorus and protective anthocyanins. So, you know, it's hotly debated. The food and drink industry is a pretty powerful lobby. Um, 
but you know if you have sort of allergies etc you can only think of the benefits the exercise from growing your own um the mental health benefits you know it, it's you know it's all there um so i think are we going to do a poll um are you currently growing um using organic principles um can we have a look at that okay so i've launched the poll so hopefully can people see that on their screens oh yes people are answering brilliant so I'll know when they stop voting because people are still voting, I'll share it. I think probably it. 76 people have not answered, but that could, could, the remainders could be yours, couldn't it? Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll end the poll and share the results. You should see this now. So 84% said yes and 16% said no. Yeah, and I think you'll probably find that um, you may well be growing using organic principles, but you don't quite realise it um, yet. And sort of, are, I'm going to sort of talk through those in a minute. Um, so if you are growing organically, um, we're going to do another poll here. So are you looking after your soil health, um, yeah. encouraging biodiversity? using resources responsibly, avoiding chemicals or keeping a healthy growing area. What, what have we got there? So I did, I did make it that you can tick multiple options if you want to, so yeah. if you've got more than one reason why you do it. Yeah, absolutely. Is he watching all the lines changing? Yeah, it's really, it's absolutely fascinating. Brilliant. So about 75% of people have participated. So I'll end that and share the results. Wow. So most I find, I find that really interesting because I think a lot of people think organic gardening, we're not using chemicals but it's about all of the other things as well. And um, encouraging biodiversity, you know, you know, a lot of us are, you know, building bug hotels, et cetera, and things like that and encouraging, you know, biodiversity. So that's good. For me, looking after your soil health, that's, I find that really interesting, 33%. Um, I'm a total soil nerd, I have to admit. And um, that is one of my, you know, specialities in that um, I have studied it sort of in depth over the years. So um, interesting on that, and we shall move on and talk about that. Um, using resources responsibly, again, really important, being a, a lot in the headlines about plastic, et cetera, and reducing use of plastic in the garden. Um, Monty Don's going on about that quite a lot on garden as well so that's good and keeping a healthy growing area interesting I would I would suggest for this keeping a healthy growing area includes all of the above um, so so that's really interesting results so um, so we'll, we'll go on now and have a look at the principles so if you want to go back to the presentation. Oh, can you see it now? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So um, the principles, um, sort of you've got five key principles here. So um, building and maintaining soil health. Um, the soil is full of life, which supports plant growth. And it's the absolute key to growing organically we've got to look after um, our soil so i shall look at that um, encouraging biodiversity so um, different life forms all have a role in creating a resilient sort of growing system so we're going to look at that one using resources responsibly and sustainably so sort of 
you know, minimum damage um, to the plant world. And we'll be looking at water, energy, wood, plastic and growing containers. And the key thing that everyone thinks immediately growing organically, avoiding harmful chemicals. So herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, damaging the health of your, not only your growing area, but actually beyond because they're getting into the soil and they're getting in beyond that into the water system. Um, and I found it interesting um, in, we had the um, last webinar, the mowing um, and the bees and where there'd been some research in um, plants that were um, signposted as being good for pollinators in garden centers, actually when they are analyzed contained two or more insecticides like um, neo uh, nicotinoids um, actually being present in those plants and um, that was quite scary for me um, I found found that like a bit wow and then maintaining a healthy growing area so you know good health um, not just disease and pest three pest free but um, having a diverse and a vigorous growing system so having good hygiene and you know having a good understanding and observation of what's actually happening there so it's all a bit of a journey um, the garden organic guide that you can sort of see there is um, a really useful reference and they use um, a bit of a traffic light system where they have green as best practice a pale green is acceptable and then you have an amber that's acceptable but not regularly and then a, a non-acceptable red um, traffic light so that's a really good booklet and you can access that via their website so it's it's a really really good reference if you're starting to grow very very useful indeed so if we move on to the next slide so soil um so the fact one of the founders of the soil association lady eve balfour she sort of um said the health of soil plant animal and man is one and indivisible it sustains us captures carbon, provides a home for billions of organisms, can help defend us against flooding and drought, but too often we are taught to think of it as dirt. As a result, many of the Earth's soil are now in crisis, they're degraded and eroding, often as a result of intensive farming practices. So, you know, soils are teeming with life. They are home to a quarter of the Earth's species which is, I, I just find that absolutely staggering. And one gram, so that's a, a quarter of a tablespoon, harbors up to 10 billion organisms. That's greater than the number of people actually on the earth. So, and only about 1% of them have been identified so far. And a lot of them are um, responsible for some of the antibiotics that we use to treat um, different diseases. Um, it takes 500 years to produce just under an inch of topsoil, which is like really sort of staggering. Uh, they, you know, soils reduce flood risk by storing water um, and organic farms have 20% more organic matter than conventional farms. So um, it's really important that we get to know our soils. So if we go, go to the first one, if you click again, so get to know your soil. So especially if you're sort of starting to grow, you know, have you got a light soil, a heavy soil? Does it hold water? Doesn't it hold water? Find out what the pH is. Is it alkaline or acid? But no one has the perfect soil. Um, so if you click again, so you can improve um, soil. So um, you can improve it with homemade garden compost that will improve your structure, your biological activity and your fertility in soil. Um, you know, compost is absolutely brilliant because it adds organic matter, but it slowly releases nutrients actually into the soil. So rather than putting a feed on that releases nutrients immediately, by sort of mulching with compost, you don't have to dig it in, 
it gradually releases nutrients into the soil. Um, so one of the things with soil is keep it covered, keep it covered with plants um, or a mulch or green manures because that protects um, and improves the soil. It stops nutrients washing away, leaching away from say a heavy rainstorm and it reduces the space that weeds can actually come in and compete with your plants. Don't try and change it too much. Um, grow plants that are suited to your pH and your soil type. You know, you could spend forever trying to sort of really change your soil. So, so you have to try and work with it. Um, try and minimize digging. Um, soil has a complex structure and worms are absolutely integral to this in that they um, provide a lot of aeration in the soil. So by digging, you actually um, break up this structure. Um, I mentioned uh, green manures. So green manures are actually great for sort of covering the soil, but then you can dig them in and add those nutrients um, back to it and organic matter as well. Um, and rotation, so a lot of people get um, a bit panicky about crop rotation and think, oh, it's really complicated. Just try and move um, the areas where you grow, move them around from year to year. And basically it's all about preventing the buildup of um, diseases um, and sort of, um, you know, funguses in the soil and build up of pests in the soil. So um, just keep, keep rotating each year so you're not sort of growing in the same place. Um, you'll get legumes will, which will fix some nitrogen. Um, some of the um, brassicas, they take a lot from the soil. They're very hungry plants. So you need to sort of add back into it. So you can add back by adding garden compost, um, well-rotted manure, um, leaf mold, um, and green manures, again, dig, digging them back in to add organic matter. So um, one thing I would say, if you are bringing in um, manures, just be aware of what the animals have been grazing on, because a few years ago, um, a lot of people on some allotments were finding um, that their tomato plants were behaving very strangely and dying. Um, and that was because the animals that had been grazing on some pasture that had had herbicides added to it. So always know where you're, if you're buying in compost or soil, where it's coming from, um, what's happened to it. So, um, so that's an important thing. So if we click again, right, growing mixes, pots and containers. So you can actually make up your own mixes. So seeds actually don't need um, many nutrients. They just need it to be quite free draining. Um, mature plants will need nutrients as long as possible into fruit, flowering and fruiting. So um, you can make your own mix, but if you're buying in compost, make sure it's peat free and organic. Um, but basically you're making, you know, you're making a mix of compost, topsoil, so loams, so uh, molehills are very good for collecting topsoil, leaf mould, um, sand and grit, and there's lots of sort of recipes out there for um, making up your own composts. Um, Fertilisers and liquid feeds, you can do your homegrown ones, um, so nettles, comfrey, um, are fantastic. Um, just rot them down in some water and they make a, a fabulous feed, um, particularly when your veg are starting to fruit. Um, so it's a great time to actually feed them with that. You can just use nettle and comfrey leaves as a mulch. Um, you can use wood ash, so you can mix that in with your compost or you can put it around, for example, your fruit bushes. Um, and you can use um, worm juice from um, your own wormeries as well um, to dilute and sort of use as a liquid feed. So, um, so lots of different things you can do there. Um, encouraging um, biodiversity. So do you want to sort of move on? Brilliant. 
so it's all about balance really and and again that's what organic growing is about it's about balance um by growing different plants you're providing a different you know ranges of habitats flowers and seeds at different times of the year that they can sort of feed on so if you click again don't be um too tidy leave some areas that are more sort of relaxed um so you know it, it doesn't have to be perfect but by you know not being too tidy you're providing those other habitats L learn to love weeds um <laughs> weeds have a lot of positives they provide food um for pollinators um nettles are brilliant for butterflies so you know do leave sort of some weeds in your growing areas and you can provide habitats via wood piles, bug hotels, ponds. So even if you're growing in pots, you can still create some ponds in containers. Um, leave hedgehog roots so that they can move from um, garden to garden, uh, provide them with houses. Hedges are brilliant for nesting birds. Um, so lots that you can do with um, providing habitats um, for, for um, insects and um, mammals. And thinking about um, pests, um, pests are a natural part of the food chain. So um, think of it as a bit of a time lapse. Um, maybe when you get a lot of aphids coming in on some of your crops, don't panic within you know one or two weeks you'll find a lot of ladybirds will move in and start feeding on them so um you know don't immediately think oh you know what am i going to do um nature will actually look after it and again we've got um don't forget about soil life feed the soil um so if you're making your own compost and adding it to it. It's not only adding um, organic matter, but your compost is um, full of invertebrates. Um, it's full of fungi and uh, mycorrhiza. And once you actually mix those with the soil, they um, will act as a sort of conduit um, for nutrients um, and plants to be able to pick up. So if we move on to the next one. So using resources responsibly. So very much when you're growing and you're using your materials, thinking about reduce, reuse, recycle, um, thinking about natural resources, you know, ask yourself, can I buy a plant-based product? Is it sturdy? Can you repair it? Can you reuse it? How are you going to dispose of it when you've actually finished with it? So, you know, use your consumer power you know, start asking. I mean, one of the things I do, if I go into a garden centre and I'm looking at, at plants, I don't want to take the plastic pot home. So I actually take it out of the pot and wrap it in newspaper and leave the pot at the garden centre. Um, and they can then look at how they're going to sort of, you know, recycle it. And it, it just puts a bit more pressure on garden centres to sort of think about what they're doing and be more responsible about it. So one of the key things, um, avoiding waste. So if we think about water, um, try not to use mains water. It's a valuable resource. So if possible, you know, harvest rainwater, use water butts, um, but really try not to use mains water. Um, be frugal with your watering um, water only when it's necessary and try and water the soil not the plants so quite often if you're watering the plants and the leaves um, that will actually encourage a lot of um, fungal diseases in so try and actually um, water the soil itself um, and you know, be be frugal with it. Don't sort of drown drown your plants every day. Only water them when when they need it, and let your plants sort of establish. So, um, if we move on to energy, think about um, manual tools. Um, can you get secondhand tools? Can you repair your tools um, rather than just going out and buying new ones? 
um, think about solar energy. Um, can you use that if you've got some sort of um, water feature or climate control in your greenhouse? Um, can you do that with solar power or can you do it manually? Um, and also um, thinking about supports, use sort of woody prunings, you know, from your, you know, from your garden. You don't have to go out and sort of buy new ones. Um, also seasonal plants as well. Make sure you're growing and planting sort of seasonally um, with wood. Um, so careful choice here. Um, to sort of try and minimize you know what you're replacing a lot of people grow in sort of raised beds so it's making sure that your wood hasn't been um, treated with chemicals in any way that it's sort of local and sustainable um, and if you are going to treat it think about um, treating it with sort of linseed um, thinking about plastic um, so much plastic in garden centres and growing, you know, from pots to polytunnels to wheelbarrows to watering cans. So really sort of trying to keep reduce, reuse, recycle sort of in mind, you know, having a look, is it a biodegradable plastic? Um, can we reuse the containers? And, and just being aware that if you are reusing some containers, some plastics um, can leach kind of chemicals um, into your growing medium and in, into your vegetables. And in the back of um, Garden Organics Principles booklet, they have actually got what, what plastics are okay and which ones aren't. So one that isn't, for example, is styrene. Um, and growing containers, um, try making your own paper pots, wooden trays, you know, have hanging baskets. Um, you can use um, long grass to line them. An old woolly jumper, you can shrink that down in a washing machine and have it like felt and use that. Um, you know, Koya products, there's a lot of those about now. Um, just beware that there's a lot of um, pots that might have peat in them. So um, just, just really double check any pots that you think um, maybe look a bit cardboardy, but they might have peat. And with tires, um, make sure you line your tires because um, some of the um, chemicals that are in tires can again migrate into the soil and into your crops. So if you're using tires, just make sure you sort of line them out. Um, and chemicals, um, so, you know, just, um, don't feel you've got to obliterate, you know, everything. Um, so you've got um, beneficial weeds. Um, so um, we're looking at avoiding, you know, harmful chemicals. So um, with sort of management, you know, a bit of weeding doesn't do you any harm. And, and this picture actually has got, shows me, I've got horsetail here. And so I just keep pulling it and, you know, it, it it, it manages, it's, it's okay. So when you're sort of clearing sort of um, open ground, um, it's, you know, weeding and hoeing, um, you know, choose a warm day, you know, when you're hoeing and your, your weeds will soon sort of die off quickly and actually go, you know, go back into the soil. Again, if you're weeding, um, annuals can go on the compost heap perennials you can dry them off or rot them off in soil um, so they become a bit gluggy and horrible but um, you can add those to your compost heap um, but it's sort of ongoing weed management really uh, you can use mulches to cover your soil and stop a lot of weeds sort of coming in um, so it you know it's an it's an ongoing ongoing sort of activity you can mulch with your compost and again that stops um uh weeds coming in um and managing diseases so you might have um physical methods um so you might try some things like um thinking about carrot root fly 
you might use some fleece or you might try and grow your carrots um, above it's about above about 18 inches um, so it's above the flight path of the um, carrot root fly you might use netting um, you can use cut plastic bottles to um, put over young plants to stop slugs coming in um, so, sorry Liz to put in there we'll have to sort of wrap up yeah we've uh, just run uh, over a bit and we need to let Jamie talk that's fine we're oh. sorry yeah I shall <laughs> finish it there so sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll sorry, just come on if you oh, oh. <laughs> no that's fine there's a few links there I think we're going to put those in the chat as well yeah um yeah, I'll share those you can get yeah. those because there's a lot of information so you can maybe follow those links through to get um more on that but Jamie we'll move swiftly on to you yeah no that was awesome well done Liz that, that was a for a presentation and you are definitely a soil nerd you would you're awarded that badge <laughs> definitely awarded that badge there's no there's like there's nothing to be ashamed of though being a soil nerd is there absolutely not absolutely not so yeah um i guess i'll start with kind of who who i am uh and probably why i'm here and what 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 i can offer more than what liz has already offered because yeah that, that was great um so i'm jamie i i'm the founder of down to earth uh, derby obviously in derby and um, I started Down to Earth, um, the project from my own conflict, and it was an idea that I had from my own back garden. So I build aeroplane engines for a living. I'm not going to give you an answer, give you a quiz to find out where that is. If I'm based in Derby, you probably know where that work. And I am a massive nature enthusiast. Um, love going for rambles in the Peak District, big grower, love growing food, think it's one of the coolest things that you can do, a lot like everyone else in here. And um, obviously the conflict is that I build airplane engines for a living and I'm an Asian enthusiast. So yeah, that's it. And I kind of, it's very overwhelming at the minute, not just because of COVID, but the environmental crisis that we're in, climate change, Everything feels like it's breaking down. Everything feels like doom and gloom. I've got a, I've got to put a roof over, over my family's head and I've got to pay the bills and I've got to put food on the table and I'm in a good job. So you can probably imagine like my situation, like the majority of people really, especially in Derby. So I've had this conflict. I'm very overwhelmed, stuck in the doom and gloom. And a lot of us feel hopeless and a lot of us feel like we ain't, we can't go anywhere. And for me, I got to the point where I was growing food in the garden and I had a bit of an epiphany where I was, it was, it was a bit of a permaculture principle where the, where the problem is actually the solution. And I was just like, I'm not having it. I'm not, not having this anymore because this, this problem that, I, that I'm feeling, this conflict that I'm feeling is actually part of the solution because the majority of people feel the same. Um, so Instead of trying to find a way to, to completely change everything, I, I went down the route of creating small changes and I started a community allotment plot where I could show people how what I thought about growing food and how growing food was what was so cool, so interesting. And if I'm honest, my, my belief is, is growing in gardening is actually an act of revolution. And it's, it is a revolutionary act. And I, and I fully believe that because as soon as you get your hands in the soil and connect with nature, um, you won't find a way back out and you'll do, you'll do whatever you can for, for nature. Um, so, yeah, I started down to earth, started wanting to show people about growing food. I started wanted to show people how amazing the Peak District is and, and how amazing how amazing nature is. And our kind of slogan is we connect people with nature, connect people with the community and we connect people with themselves because ultimately we are all connected to the natural world. Although as a shop floor factory fitter, telling that to the lads that I work with, they won't understand that, which is part of the problem that we face. So we need to uh, 
um, attack the problems that we face in a way that is actually accessible and digestible for the for the everyday person. So um, yeah, went down that route, started growing food, started started a community plot, taking people out for walks, and yeah, it kind of went from there. And I'd say that the, the benefits of growing your own food and, and like how incredible that is as a journey is is amazing. It's absolutely it is an incredible journey to go on and I don't need to tell anyone because I'm sure you could all comment from what I'm about to say because you've all done this like you've all you've all you all started that journey for a reason and you'll know that when you start that you, you can't stop that and the benefits as Liz says and as as um, DB, DWT webinar said um, is that it's so good for your health and well-being it's so good for your mental health because you are part of nature and you're connecting to what you are and you're doing something, you're giving back to earth. And that is one of the most important things that you can do. Um, so yeah, I'll probably leave it at that because people who might be in this talk now know that I can waffle on. What I will say, I'll talk about what we can plant now because of first, first time gardeners and, and, and first, first year growers, I think this is really important to, to know what you can actually kind of grow at this time of the year. Um, th this time of the year is called second spring. Some of you might know that. To be fair, I didn't actually know that. I've only been growing for four years, but I, I didn't actually know that. And you can actually grow a lot of stuff. Whereas before years gone by, I would have gone, well, that's it now. Season's done. Summer's end of season's done, which is, which is actually totally not true. So what we can grow, we can grow lettuce. We can grow pak choy, we can grow kale, uh, mizuna, mustard, which can act as a um, mustard can act as a green manure. Um, and if you do have any bare soil, cover it with green manure. Green manure, you can get leg, uh, legumes, you can get um, mustard, you can get phacelia, which is lovely. Phacelia is one of the best green manures, personally, as it um, it's very good for biodiversity. And when it flowers, it's beautiful. Uh, spring cabbages, spinach. Um, there's so much stuff that you can grow. Salad crops. It's a brilliant time to grow salady stuff, and especially um, if you've got like window sills and stuff. And people, there's a lot of people in here who've said that they actually uh, haven't got a garden and they're growing in like courtyard spaces or or uh, on on window sills and balconies and stuff. One, one of the great things I, that I think is when you when you do go to the supermarket and buy food, um, buying stuff like mushrooms and, and stuff that comes in containers, you're getting a two in one. You're getting veg and you're getting trays that you can use. You put holes in them. I, we've, we use mushroom containers for, for our growing. We grow sweet peas in, in, put it, uh, in fruit put it, uh, containers. And, and if you're growing salads, and, and growing lettuce, you can grow lettuce, microgreens exactly. Um, lettuce, you can grow that on a windowsill in a little mushroom mushroom box. So yeah, sowing broad beans in autumn, um, you can do broad bean, you can do, I've not done this before, but in October, it's a very good time to start your garlic. It's a very good time to start your garlic. Radishes as well is a great one. And turnips, turnips a great one. And I'm gonna just, slow down on that because I know that's a lot to take in and there's a lot to sow and I don't want to overwhelm people because at the end of the day it doesn't matter what you're going to plant and it doesn't matter if you don't get around to it and I think that's a really important point to make out for exactly for these first-time growers is that don't get stressed don't get hassled don't worry about it if you miss it like it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because if you start worrying about things that's not what you got into it for so yeah, onions and shallots and stuff like that. And I think one of the most important things is, is to go back to composting. Uh, composting is another act of, of revolution. I, I feel that strongly about it. And I feel I know others in this group will as well. Composting. I was gonna get my worm bucket. I've got a vermicompost farm. I was going to bring it in, but I don't think my wife would have been very happy to if I bang that on the dining room table um, after we've cleaned it, after the kids have been eating. So we um, we worm farm, which is basically we we've got a we've got an area designated to feeding worms, 
uh, our food, our kitchen waste. Um, ours is outside because it's quite a big one, but uh, I think Jordan will put a link in for a friend of mine who is a worm farmer, the urban worm, uh, the wormologist on Instagram. She's the one who kind of taught me about vermicomposting and how amazing worms are. They are so impressive. Um, uh, interesting doom and gloom fact that I will bang out there is, and it's one that's been flying around for a very long time, is that apparently we've got 50 years of topsoil left. This, this, this fact's been going around for about 15 years. It's probably nothing near that hour. It's probably more horrifying than that, but, but worm farming is magic. And, and bringing that magic to um, to life and bringing it into an actual environment that you can actually use it is amazing. Worms are, are an amazing thing, but I will, I'm digressing. I'll leave that to another, that's another completely another presentation. Um, but yeah, composting, get into it, just get into it, just see how you go, because you'll start, you'll start seeing how much food is actually wasted and instead of seeing it as a waste you'll see it as a resource because you'll be feeding worms they'll be feeding going back into your feeding your garden or your veggie patch or allotment whatever um so other stuff that you can sow so it's not just vegetables you might just think i like growing veg because it's not people don't normally necessarily think blokes like me like growing flowers but i love i love flowers i love flowers um in september you can actually grow like annuals you can grow um marigolds you can even grow you can get wildflowers out now which is amazing wildflowers are amazing if, if done well wildflowers um can create such a lo lovely patch gardens even in pots in tubs um even on allotment plots, really, you might get in trouble with the committee, but chuck them down. They're good. They're good for. They're good for the planet, and they're good for your soil because it's a cover crop. Um, marigolds, love marigolds. They're great. They're a great, great flower, not just for um, biodiversity, but also a companion plant that can be used with a with a lot of various veg. That they kind of have a symbiotic relationship. Uh, and and they support each other. Nigella, Nigella. Actually, I grew Nigella for the first time this year, and I think the seed pods are just as pretty as the flowers. Just as pretty, and birds love Nigella. They 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 love not they love Nigella, and we want to save our seed heads as well. We want to. It might look messy, but that's nature, and we should just leave it because that's wild, and we should be saving them for the, the, the wildlife, because that's their feed. Um, yeah, one last thing, autumn is a great time to sow them green manures. Um, so it's, it's a great thing to, to do. At last year, last season was our first time using green manure, and we definitely saw the um, impact that it had on our soil. Um, what I will say is that our allotment plots, we actually practice no dig. Uh, no dig when we practice no dig straight from the start start no dig for those who don't know is literally it does what it says on the tin you do not turn the soil you do not dig the, the soil over and what we do is is build on that on that level of soil and we build on it and we enrich it and i think what we would probably term what we how we grow is is regeneratively and what we've learned from trying to grow regeneratively over the last three and a half years. I'm no expert, by the way. I'm just talking from my own experiences and, and just blagging it, like January, just blagging it and just observing nature and seeing how things reacted and seeing how things might not have worked and seeing how things worked and, and seeing how amazing produce was on areas that we did really go for the green manure. Um, I'd say growing regeneratively over the last three and a half years has just been one of the one of the most um, incredible experiences. Just observing nature and actually going, you don't need all this stuff on the shelves and all this stuff that they say you need to grow food and garden. You don't. You don't need any of it at all. 
and seeing how giving the more you give back the more you give and the more you give back the more you get back and it's it's incredible when you sit when that actually happens so yeah we we practice no dig we 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 use regenerative practices where we try and compost everything put everything back in keep it as close loop as possible and yeah we, we're seeing really good returns on that um so there's my there's my list of growing things that I never normally do. I can't believe I've done my own work for this one. And now I'll talk about uh, community groups. So for those who, who want to garden more and want to grow more and want to take their garden into the next level as an act of revolution, uh, there is no thing better than community. Something that has absolutely been um, dilapidated over well in my lifetime i've seen i've seen how communities just falling apart and growing food together and eating food together that you've grown and and socializing in a in a natural space is it's primal it's it's ancestral it's part of being human and i think everybody should be should be doing stuff like this um so yeah we we started the community allotment plot from a friend of mine who actually asked me um he asked me to take over his plot basically i took it over more friends got involved friends of friends got involved and it was like oh well maybe we need to do something a bit more organized for for people because they actually want this social they want to join this kind of social but they actually don't know how to go about it or they've not seen how it's about so we use social media to, to get to get people to engage with us and yeah, we, we, we grow food together, but also we enjoy the crack and we enjoy the social and we go for a beer after. Um, and it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. It's great. Like it, it supports a lot of our, of our members and a lot of our volunteers, mental health, like the messages that I receive from, from our team and from, our, for, from the community that we've created are really, really uh, great and they keep us going. Um, so yeah, I, I would say if anyone has any questions about community growing or how you go about it, you can ask me and I'll try and answer them questions. But what we'll do, I think we've got a video for, <laughs> we've got a testimonial and we're going to see if it works. Aren't we, Jordan? It's been uh, like waving this bean around. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to share it now, so here we go. Sometimes with the videos, um, the person sharing it looks like it's playing absolutely fine. For everybody else, it can be a little bit jumpy, um, sometimes a little bit delayed. If we have problems with it, we will send out a link to it afterwards so everyone does get to see it properly, but here goes. Land to Earth Project is a great place for us to spend time together. Being able to go with my kids, that's Thomas. And be out outside with nature, growing vegetables, cooking the vegetables, meeting new people. I was there around the inception and to see it go from just a few lads meeting up in an allotment to the community element and aspect that it has now. Especially with all of like life's restrictions at the minute. It's uh, like a sanctuary for us. We've been able to go and, and enjoy getting our hands dirty. So many of us growing up as, as Teenagers in this time had no connection to our own food. We just got it and our parents made it or we go to supermarkets. My favourite thing is spending time with my dad and putting my hands in some mud. I've had the best time. Spending time with people that we probably wouldn't normally mix with. The work that Down to Earth is doing and what it's doing in Derby is helping this younger generation understand where our food comes from, which is so important. We love to get down on the allotment, plant some veg and be able to watch it grow and then uh, be able to dig it up and eat it at the end of the season. Well, Dad likes that best. <laughs> I do. Just needs to keep going and we need to grow this and, and get it out to more people if possible to help the future generations. We can't wait to keep going and keep seeing the group growing bigger and bigger. It's not nice, isn't it? How did that play? Did that play okay? Yeah, really well. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was like a that was a testimonial, um, which I think 
it's always nice to see see what people think to what we're doing. Love Lila. Lila's a little girl with a dad. She's so funny. She's so cheeky, but it's great. It's a it's a great thing. And there's a movement in in growing food together. Um, and with with the terrible food system that we have in place in today's day and age, and the practices that we use, especially in monocrop culture. Um, it's, it's not just destroying our own health and our own well-being, but that of the planet. So if we can localise and, and come together as communities to grow food and, and understand where that food comes from, um, we are going to create a healthier planet, not just for us as, as a human species, but for every other animal that is on this planet. And I will leave that righteousness there. Um, we are we are um, looking at creating some workshops and we're looking at uh, inviting more volunteers down to our allotment spaces. Uh, we're, we're looking to do a lot more exciting work and we're looking to grow, not just as a community, but as an organisation. Obviously, I, I'm, as you can imagine, from my experiences and where I come from, I would have dreamt about this in a million years, five years ago. And and if I saw myself five years ago and told me this was going to be me, I probably would have laughed. But here I am. And we're um, yeah, we're on our we're on our way up and we want people to join, join what we're about. Um so yeah, that's 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 all I've got to say. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. <laughs> We've got We've just got a couple of questions in the um, Q&A. So if you haven't already found it, but you've got something you want to ask, there should be a button that says Q&A somewhere. Click on that and pop your question in. And um, I'll ask the few that are here at the moment. So Jackie has asked, uh, she's interested in any carrot growing tips, please. She has very little success and can they grow in tubs? Go on, Liz, you've got more experience than me. I can, well, I, I can go, yeah, they can grow in tubs. Um, a couple of varieties that are good in tubs are Paris Market, and these are like little golf ball shaped carrots. They grow very well in tubs. And also the Chantenay type um, varieties that are very sort of short cylindrical ones, they grow brilliantly in tubs as well. Um, but carrots tend to like a lighter soil, so a lighter, a lighter mixture in the tub. So if you mix a bit of sand or grit in as well, um, you'll, you'll get a better carrot and you'll get a better germination rate. But carrots can be tricky. You know, I'm not saying by doing that they'll be perfect, but they can be tricky. But they are varieties that do well in tubs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK, the next question is from Kate. And she says, one problem I'm having when I'm growing from seed in pots, before I pot out, I always seem to get white, fluffy looking mould on top of the soil. I've tried different soils, compost, and I just in the air vents on the lids. Any advice gratefully received? Jamie? Oh, well, shall I? I say it. It'll be humidity. Um, yeah. Go on, Liz, go for it. Go for it. You're you are the expert. No, no, no. You I'll just back no, I'll back you no, up. You, you... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's um humidity that will cause that problem. So um, you know, if if you're germinating your seeds in and it's too humid and you're maybe um being a bit over enthusiastic with watering, um, the humidity can cause the sort of mold growth. So, so if you increase your ventilation, then it should be better. Brilliant. Thank okay. you. And um, Paul has asked, what is the ratio for comfrey feed? I made this. It absolutely honks, doesn't it? <laughs> 10 to 1. I'd say 10 to 1, Liz. Uh, I've got one yeah, yeah. I, I generally use a, a spread tub um, in a watering can. So yeah, 10 to 1's about on the money. 
and it does honk if you get it splash it on you it will follow you around for days <laughs> yeah i can remember my hands just smelling it of it for ages afterwards it was yeah pretty pretty right <laughs> um yeah, if you want to go to the supermarket and get clear the aisles, you know, people will get out your way. <laughs> I think I might have seen a question pop up in the chat, actually. I'm just having a problem. Yeah, there's a few in the chat. Do you want me to read the ones I've found? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we've got one from Wendy that said, all my crops were devastated by slugs. Please, can you advise the best plan of action for next year? I've tried eggshells, gravel, beer traps, and nematodes. Didn't try copper. Would this possibly work? So what do we do about slugs? <laughs> can she move? Can she move that pot? Sounds like she's tried everything there. Um, I would actually probably go down the route of trying to create some wildlife habitats if you can and try and bring um, toads, frogs, hedgehogs. Like if you can get hedgehogs in your, in your garden, that is going to be really helpful. Um, as well, birds, like bringing birds in, in, into the garden, obviously they will eat slugs. This is the thing with our allotment, for example, we've kind of never had an issue, touch wood, touch wood, with, with pests, especially um, slugs, um, because of the way that we grow and because of the companion plants that we use uh, and trying to be as biodiverse as, po as possible and bringing as much wildlife in as possible uh, and, and looking after the soil, we've been really, really either lucky and now we've observed that it's kind of made sense that it's kind of balanced out. Or saying that, probably next season, we will get wrote off by slugs now. Um, yeah, it's just part and parcel, I think. It's just part and parcel. I think you might have really bad, you might have a really bad season with slugs this season. Um, and next season, you, you may triumph and you might not have any of the issues. I'm sure there's some different herbs that you can grow in the garden that help with deterring slugs, but... Liz, I don't know if you have you got anything else to add on to that. I, I would just sort of say, you know, if you have got space for a pond, um, or even if you um, make a pond in a container um, and encourage, you know, if you can encourage, you know, frogs and toads in, um, they, you know, do really help. But it is about that balance. Um, with the um, nematodes, if you're, it's about watering them on when the soil is moist and then they will be able to sort of spread through the soil. Um, if you get a dry spell, then they don't tend to work sort of very well at all. But we have a really big problem here on our small holding with slugs and um, I resort to picking them off. Um, I quite often put tiles down or bits of slate down and in the morning I'll go out. Um, so rather than going around at night with a torch um, in my pajamas or whatever, I'll um, go in the morning, lift the tiles up and then I'll pick the actual slugs off. And I'm lucky in that I've, I've got some chickens and I'll um, feed them to them. But um, otherwise you can sort of dispose of them by sort of taking them a distance away if you can. Um, but yeah, slugs can be tricky, copper, um i do put copper around some of my containers and it does seem to work um for me anyway um in theory it's supposed to give them you know a little bit of a shock as they go across it and it deters them and they'll, they'll look for easier pickings so um copper tape you know has worked for me on containers definitely I think another thing to do a school activity with kids with snails and slugs where we tested all those barrier methods, shells, Brilliant. coffee granules, copper, they, they got over everything. <laughs> I think I think one of the things as well, what one of the one of the, a really good thing could be um is to kind of set like a trap, like a bit of an area where you just grow stuff that you're not bothered about. And then, and then kind of 
they'll deter to that area and you, and you can let them just have their way with them. <laughs> or get some ducks. Get, so get some yeah, Indian runner exactly. ducks. If you can do that, just grab some of them. They, yeah, they, have... they love slugs. Yeah, they're sacrificial plants. Yeah. I know at Garden Organic we did loads of trials when I worked, worked with Garden Organic and bran seemed to work the best because the slugs tended to feed up on the bran. So they sort of stuffed themselves basically and then they didn't actually want to eat the plants. So um, so that, that was the one that we found, you know, worked, worked you know, the best. I think we've got one more question in the chat. Um, Jordan has said there's one about community groups. Can you see? Uh, yes, uh, Anne yeah, has asked about community gardens. She said, do they work better in an area that lends itself to that, such as an estate with neighbours to garden together or as a much wider community? Um, I can't say, actually, but I can speak from experience what we what we have is a urban um, allotment centre to the city um, of Derby, um, and we we see we see people from so many different backgrounds and so many different walks of life join join us. Some of them come, some of them go, some of them become part of the team, some of them go into their own gardening journey, their own growing journey. Um, so yeah, I think it. I think it depends. I can't really speak from from my my experience, but that's what what's happened from from what we've done. Um, but I would think one of the best things that we need to do um, as people is probably start more community gardens in in built up areas, especially where there's a lot of concrete. That's what we need. Thank you very much. No, no yeah. answer. And. Uh... That was a good answer. There's, a, there's an organisation. <laughs> there's an organisation called Social Farms and Gardens, and mm. um, they have a sort of community garden network across the UK, and they can also provide a lot of advice and support, ref the legalities of it, etc. And a lot of toolkits and things like that. So um, social farms and gardens are a good, good source of help as well. Thank you both. I think, oh, a big question to finish in the chat. Can we be completely sufficient in the UK for food? Uh, yes. Massive question. <laughs> I suppose the thing is, it, it depends what you want to eat, doesn't it? You know, if you want to eat in things theory. flown in, then no, we can't. But yeah, as somebody says in the chat, we need to change our diets. We need to change, be more seasonal, don't we? Like we used to be, not wanting things all year round. We can't be having strawberries at Christmas time, can we? We, we need to just get rid of that now. We need to give up on that. Um, we should aim, we should aim for our, all of our food to come from the, the country that you live in. Obviously, we've got a massive problem in front of us and we've created our own problem with Brexit. But instead of seeing that as a problem, we could see it as a solution and we could actually start thinking about how we can create localised, decentralised food systems that are easy to get around the country. This, this, the land that we live on in, in the UK, in, in England, has been fought over, over centuries, over thousands of years. It's been pillaged. And, and ransacked and invaded because it's got the most, some of the greatest pasture lands in, in the world at one time. And now um, there's a chance that we could start, we should start going back to, and looking at that. We should be saying, what if, especially with the situation that we're in now, what if, like you, you look at what, what's happened with the lorry driver situation recently and food shortages, which, according to the professionals, food structures are going to get worse. So, yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, we could, but we've got to be pragmatic about it. We've got to be open to every single uh, avenue we can go down with our diet. And also, we've got, to, we've got to start being realistic and start coming together 
and start seeing what we can actually do. And that is what I'm going to say. But your first step is go and have a rummage, find a nice, something that can be a nice pot and start. Oh, for God's sake, I messed that up, didn't I? <laughs> Damn. So we can yeah. start today. Leave the webinar now. Go and find a container you can grow something in. Put some soil in it. Can we do that again? Can we do that last <laughs> sentence again? Oh, wrecked it, Anna. No, it's okay. I was no, just start, putting the link start in. Start growing with what you like. That's yeah. it. Start Grow what growing you like. what you like to eat. And oh. it's we've all become conditioned. Um, and yeah, the supermarkets and the power of the supermarkets. Um, and they say, oh well, we provide what the customer wants. Um, we need to use our consumer power to actually say, no, this is what we want and when we want it. But again, it's it's all the issues around affordability and yeah, cost. And um, we ha we have just become conditioned and we've forgotten how to cook. Um, we all say we're time short. Um, so yeah, there's lots of issues around that. But but yes, in theory, we could could be self-sufficient especially if we're going towards a more plant-based diet i'm saying grow what you like i know this will be the case for many people with kids they often are fussy eaters particularly when it comes to vegetables but if they grow them they tend to be a lot more willing to try eating them and i know my two have started eating a lot more things since we've been growing it ourselves so grow what you like but they'll soon like more if you start growing it i think it's the interaction, isn't it? If you start, mm. if you, if you make an interaction with food, and you and you get people understanding where it comes from and engaging with it, they're gonna want, they're gonna grow towards it. Um, but yeah, I think we, we are preaching to the choir because there's a lot of people in here that are growers already, which is great. But we want to yeah. see people growing in pots, don't we? That's what that's what we're here for. And if all of these people that's go away. Right. Right. You know, sign up for it, they put a little sign in the window. If everybody here encourages one other person to grow in a pot, we've doubled the effort already. Or if you grow stuff in pots, leave your pots on your front and let people take them so they can grow yeah. them at home. And then we're leaving an aren't yeah. we? Well, we? Then we... Yeah, we've got uh, <laughs> plant and share. Our get-togethers, we have a plant and share in um, April and um, May um, so I'd say well don't just leave it in April and May plant and share now you know what you or plant a little extra and share it with your neighbor and that way you know spread the message we could all be like gorilla go potiers and like plant lots of things and go and leave them on people's doorsteps that's it that's it that's what we've got yeah. to do just leave with a little note this is how to grow me, and here's a recipe. That's perfect. And it's the Go Potty Fairy. It really works because things <laughs> like people scared. Yeah. Right. We, brilliant. We have run over. Go potty thank you so much like for your that. time, Liz and Jamie. That's been brilliant. Um, I'm yeah. sure everybody on here is going to run away now and find a pot to plant in and a spare pot to give away to somebody as well. Um, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. A and um, there will be lots of tips coming your way through your emails everyone so thank you for joining us enjoy the rest of your beans jamie i'm gonna eat them all now <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you for coming good night cheers bye, bye.